What? It's it's valid and it's not rude. Okay. Welcome to week eleven. And I'm going to count and see how many people stop talking. There we go. All right. So I'm going to pick up from where we left off last week. Some of you will notice that this week's slideshow is slightly different than what you'll find on Brightspace. As I was reviewing it, I realized I already covered the first four or five slides last week for this out of this week's. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not going over this a second time. Toss. So it's actually going to be pretty, not short, but not a super long lecture. And then I'm going to start going over assignment two because it's that time of the year where I give gifts of pain. Okay, so essentially what I'm going to be talking about this week is aggregate functions. Aggregate functions are functions that are available inside of a database server that allows you to... Oh, yes. No, I just hit freeze because I didn't need to see people me try to type in my password like four times. I had changed my password yesterday. My password expired. So it's fun. Our passwords expire, students don't. My daughter's had the same password the last four years. Okay, so aggregate functions. Aggregate functions are functions that are built into an SQL server. Yes? Do we what? It's not showing up? Oh, come on, bright space. I even hit the publish button. No, it's already there. It's just the, every once in a while, Brightspace has a moment. Oh, look at that. Son of a bitch. Oh, uh, you know what? Forget, send it off. Uh, is there any content for week 13? Sure. There we go. There we go. Nobody needs to ask me for the next three weeks. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really on top of my game today. Good job, Dan. All right, let's start again. Aggregate functions. Unless somebody else has something else they want to, to bring to my attention that I'm not succeeding at today. Okay. Aggregate functions are functions that are built into a database server that allows you to summarize data. Most of the functions will operate on a single row. However, aggregate functions are designed to operate on multiple rows. This is where I bring back Excel for everybody's you know, thought process. And or if you don't know Excel, I think in Mac it's called numbers. And or in OpenOffice, I think it's just called spreadsheet. In, for those that have worked with spreadsheets or spreadsheet software have experienced the concept of hitting a button and it adds up all the values or it finds the average of all the values in a column, that kind of stuff. That's what aggregate functions are for. They're there to help you summarize data. Uh, often, most often you use in reports, although there's a few that are used to, for some nifty other little tricks. And some of the more common ones you, you'll encounter is count. Either count all the rows uh, or count where a given column name, the values are not null. So sometimes you want to know how many values are not null. That's the count if you name it a specific column. Uh, sum, which lets you, you know, add it up. Average, I think you guys might know what an average is. And then you got min and max. Uh, min gives you the minimum value of all the values that have been pulled. Max gives you the maximum value of any given value that's been pulled. So for example, uh, you're trying to figure out the minimum and maximum temperatures for this day in history for the last 10 years. The min could read a temperature and give you the lowest temperature. The max would read and give you the highest temperature. Um, and after all that clicking around, my clicker doesn't work anymore. Okay, so I didn't really update the slides that show the SQL parts of this very much because honestly, the, the, these concepts are easier demonstrated. Uh, but basically, sum adds up all the values in a given numeric column. 
You cannot sum alphanumeric. Pretty sure you can't go uh, Q plus five plus Z plus three. Um, it's in Java that would give you a string. Maybe if it doesn't give you an exception on you know mismatched data types. Same idea here. Um, and these are just slightly, apparently the same thing over and over and over again, except uh, on the second one, they decided to give an alias, which we learned about last week, so that we have something decent. Now, you'll see here it says no column name. That's not necessarily true. Different database servers will output something different. Um, MySQL often will put out just the word, the name of the function. Um, or it'll actually put out the entire function as the name of the column. Um, Postgres will give a, just, will just literally just say sum, min, max as the name of the column, which is not always useful. Um, Microsoft SQL Server will co come back with no column name, which is where this picture comes from. And Oracle, I have no idea because I haven't used Oracle since I was in college. And that was 26 years ago. So it's a little vague. Now, what is kind of cool with the aggregate functions is you can run them multiple aggregate functions at the same time. So you can literally get the min, max, average, and sum all in one go. And it'll return multiple values. And now I'm just going to demonstrate this stuff. So, same database I was using last week. So if I want to go account... There, there's 3,000 lines in my order lines table, or 3,000 entries. I can go, I want to have the, um, and now I'm not typing anywhere. And that adds up every order line which is cool. Now, if I want to, I can also do with a min. Why is it doing this? Min total, max total, and I don't want to do that. And you can see the minimum, the maximum, the total, and I could also look at what the average is. And there, the average selling price in this table is 271.63. And literally, that's pretty much all there is to basic aggregate functions. It doesn't get much more complicated than this. Now, why would you want to use this and not get, I don't know, your Java application, your PHP application to do the bath for you? Um, <clears throat> there's a few reasons, actually, you'd want to do it. Uh, one. The database server is optimized to do it. Somebody already wrote the functionality. What's the first rule of programming? Don't re-implement something that somebody else did better than you already. Don't reinvent the wheel. Two, the pocket protectors that wrote the functions inside the database server are probably way better at it than you are. Eventually, you may get there. I'm not even going to pretend I understand how they do it. That's way above my pay grade. I'm just happy it works. And three, the database server will do it really, really fast. Uh, probably way faster than whatever code you wrote. So those are some of the reasons why you'd want to let the database server do this work. Um, now, the one that's called count is one of the ones that is often used in applications. It's just to double check, make sure there's rows that match a certain criteria. So you can do a count star where whatever the parameters are. And that allows you to at least know if there are rows for you to operate against. And then you could retrieve the rows. So instead of going select star from whatever table and pray that it returns data back, you'd first run a count, see the results of the count, if it's greater than zero, then you execute the expensive query. And right now, you guys haven't seen what's called an expensive query. You'll be learning about those next week. 
Um, these are simple queries. They're not expensive by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, by expensive, I don't mean, you know, it costs a lot of money. It's they use a lot of RAM and a lot of CPU process. That's why they're expensive. Just like there's certain applications that are expensive to run on your computer. Chrome. One of the biggest pigs on any computer. It, it is. It's one of the worst. Have you ever seen how much RAM Chrome eats? Control shift escape. Can you look at your processes and look at what Chrome's eating? 661 megs. Right, and you just launched it. Well, yeah, but you've closed your laptop and turned it back on. That means the RAM's been refreshed. So I'm just using that example. Chrome is expensive. Video games are expensive. Some more than others. Counter-Strike, not so much. Cyberpunk, very much so. Those are the example of expensive because they use a lot of memory and a lot of computer resources. These queries are not. Um, okay, so this is cool. And of course, the aggregate functions will work with your typical where clauses. And suddenly you'll see that my numbers are changing because I'm reducing the results. Now, one of the things you need to know about aggregate functions, and I'm sure it's going to show up in the slides, but I'll bring it up now since I'm thinking about it. Aggregate functions operate after the data is retrieved. So essentially what it's doing is it will do a select star, pull back those rows, and then operate based on whatever functions I asked. So aggregate functions have to happen after the data has been retrieved. And in a minute, I'll explain why that's important. Try that again. Yeah. Yeah, well, no, the, um, yeah, well, that's exactly it because it's got to filter it down before it was reading the entire table because it's already read and it's cached. Now I ran it again, this result's cached because the query optimizer knows I ran this query at least once in the last so many seconds. Therefore it's saying, oh, I've already seen this data set. I've got this data set in memory, so I can just operate against it. That's what I'm talking about. You know how the database servers, the guys who wrote it are probably way better programmers than, you know, on average, because they've been doing this forever. And they've learned, the query optimizers know that these things have been run. The data sets have been loaded in memory and they operate there. Uh, if I were to change this to something else like 50 and 150, now it's already read the entire table, so it's going a little faster. If I were to take a little break and not touch it for a bit, it'll come back and be slow again for the first query after. Okay. And that's the count. Okay, so here's another important one. And I'm so glad that the person who put these slides together actually brought this one in. This is something that a lot of people don't realize you can do. Um, I actually had a programmer at work who's been working databases for years and he didn't realize you could do this. Because um, he always put the distinct on the outside. So if you do a count and you include the distinct keyword inside the count function, it will only count the unique values of that column. So if I go back to my order lines, just to show you guys, so if I go just uh, select star, for starters, right? And I go, um, I want to count the list, 209. Well, that's kind of cool. Uh, but now if I go count distinct list, there's exactly 100. So what's happening is it's not just counting the items in the, the column called list. It's actually counting only the unique value. So it only counts each thing once. If you are trying to find out very precise values for counts, this is how you do it. Now I'm just taking a pause in case somebody has a question before I continue. 
Is that kind of clear what that does? So without the distinct 209, with the distinct 100, because in one case it's counting only the unique values, the other one just counts everything returned. In the actual real world, uh, you okay? For example, um, one of the database tables at work uh, keeps track of network activity that hits a certain web page, and we want to know how many unique IP addresses have hit the web page. Now, the thing is that a person or a bot may hit that page multiple times a day with the same IP address, but we don't want to count. Every single time the page was loaded, we just want to know how many unique IP addresses were pulled. That is when you'd use the distinct keyword where you want to count only the distinct IP addresses. So it only count the ones, it only counts each one once. So then you know how many different ones there are as opposed to how many there are total. Okay. Um, outside of that, they might want, uh, you'd use a people's uh, grades, letter grades. You know, you want to know how many people got A. You don't, or you want to know how many distinct letter grades are in a system, which obviously we know it's A to F, but in theory, you could actually ask for distinct grades per course or something like that. Um, that was a really stupid example. I, after I finished talking about it, I realized it was really, that second one was dumb. First one was way better than the second one. Okay. So that's one you'd use distinct. Now, the next one is about grouping. And grouping is an interesting um, thing because it allows you to summarize based on um, categories. So for anybody in here who's ever done surveys, not done surveys as in you filled one out, as in you had to handle the data that came out of the survey. So, you know, the big stack of papers came back and then you want to know how many and how many said yes to question one, how many people said no to question two, but you also need to know how many said yes to question two, because, you know, you need to know both sides because maybe somebody abstained and chose not to answer question two. Therefore, you need to be able to group by question. And as someone, when when I went through school in high school, um, we were lucky enough that my school actually had computers. I know it sounds really stupid saying that nowadays, but a lot of high schools in the late eighties, early nineties, barely had computers for most of their students. Um, laptops didn't exist. Well, they existed, but man, they were like chonkers. Um, so we did surveys because you know we part of our whatever course we were taking, we did surveys. And we had to learn how to summarize that kind of stuff. And let me tell you, it really, really sucked doing it. So database servers allow us to do grouping. And uh, this is an example that has absolutely everything in it, uh, including the kitchen sink. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to demonstrate the grouping and then I'm going to get, I'm going to talk about that other clause that's sitting on there, which is having. Okay. So if I go select a uh, list, comma, uh, cost. So this is the cost for each of these, um, apparently, uh, drugs. Well, they're like prescriptions, not the, not the fun ones. These are the ones you have to take as things aren't going so well, or because you took the fun ones. So anyways, So we got the name of a drug and we've got a cost. And if I want to create an aggregate and I want to know, okay, what is the average cost for each drug? If I go AVG cost, and then I want to group by, in this case, the drug, which is list. And we end up with a much shorter list, 
124 rows, because there's only 124 different drugs in these, whatever, 2,000 rows of data. And it gives me the average price that each drug was sold for. Which we can get pretty nifty here. We can go min, uh, min cost, max cost, like that. So then we can see, you know, the minimum was sold for, the maximum was sold for, that kind of stuff. The numbers are all fic fictional, by the way. So, um, which is cool. Now, let's go see if they finally fixed MySQL or not. And they have not. Uh, no, hang on, let me go, uh, let me just go do this and do this instead. And they have not. Okay, so what I just did right here, what I'm doing right now on any other database server other than MySQL will give you an error. It's going to say, no, you don't know what you're doing. MySQL goes, bruh, I gotcha. I'm assuming you want me to summarize everything based on the very first row of data I find, which is not what's being asked. Every other database server requires you to have a group by for every non-aggregate column. So, for example, right now here I have list. List is not an aggregate function. It's just being pulled and displayed. If I've got a column that is not part of one of these aggregates, it has to be included in a group by. And people will say, well, why? what's wrong with what was happening before? Because it's useless data. That number has nothing to do with the name of the drug that's pulled. It's just saying, I'm going to show the very first name I find and then do the rest of the work on everything else I found. It's useless. It's misleading. It's, in, it's invalid. Um, it's a bug with MySQL. Now, you can actually group by multiple columns at once. And I'm going to demonstrate that one by switching over to my customers table. Select a name, comma, province. I think it's province. Region. Okay, first of all, run it. Prove that the base query works. And now I am going to go count of star group by region. Actually, you know what? I'm going to change this to city and region. So here's what the what's happening is what I'm asking it to do is I wanted to count how many customers I have in each city and region combination. So for example, if we have the same city name in multiple locations and multiple regions, well, we still want to know how many people are in each of those individual cities, but technically they're not in the same place. Therefore we need different totals for them. So the way the grouping works and you got multiple columns to group by is it'll summarize first by region and then subdivide by city. So it calculates everybody in Georgia and then divides it for everybody in each of the cities afterwards. So it operates both. And as you can see, I've got the order of the columns here does not match the order of the columns up here. It makes absolutely no difference what order these are in. The important one is the order down here because that's how it's going to summarize the data. So if I went summarize by city first and then by region, we'll probably end up with very likely might have smaller numbers. Uh, let's go see what happens. Or we get up with the same numbers because that's just how I generated the data. That's always fun. I'm trying to make a point and my data doesn't let me prove a point, but that's okay. Um, normally that would make a difference. Actually, did it make a difference? One, 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 one. Oh, 
one, 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 one. Of course, it's my data is not big enough to actually prove it. And I can't connect to the VPN at work because I'd pull it out of a really big database and prove it that this works. Uh, anyways. Um, so yes, take my word for it, it does work. Now, the next clause is see on here. Actually, what's the next slide say? Yes, okay. We're gonna talk about grouping, some of the rules. So the where clause specify which rows will be used to determine uh, the groups. Man, these slides are completely out of order. I'm coming, coming back to this in a second. Uh, this one shows, you know, what I just demonstrated with multiple columns as the summary. And this is the, you must have the group by, an example of an error message. That's what MySQL, uh, Microsoft SQL Server will tell you. Um, other database servers will give you similar errors. But yes, if you don't include um, a column name that is not in an aggregate, if you don't do a group by it, it's gonna blow up. And order by does the exact same thing as it would before. Um, it makes absolutely no difference. You can sort by the aggregate function. You can sort by the alias. It's all cool. Okay, which brings me to the having clause, which is over. I'm going to talk about it here. So last week I talked about where. What does the where clause do? It filters the list of rows being returned, right? So it allows you, to, it's like your Boolean expressions, your if statements in Java. You're going, if row matches this condition, yes, it's allowed to return. Anything that evaluates to true in the where clause will return. Having does the exact same thing, except it does it on after the aggregates have been run. So I could go with this process. I want to count everybody in this room that originates from Ottawa originally. So I could say, okay, Everybody from Ottawa on this side of the room. Everybody not from Ottawa on this side of the room. Cool. Now I, I could say, okay, now I just wanted to group by countries. So this side of the room is now going to be operated on because Ottawa is all going to be in Canada. And I'm going to count down all the ones that originate outside of Canada. And I want it to be grouped by um, the countries. So suddenly, you know, I'll add up all the ones where people come from the same place. And then I can say, I only want to know the ones where I have a single student that comes from a given country. That's what having does. So after you've done all the math, it filters what's left. It's easier if I demonstrate. So I'm going to get rid of the order by because it works. Do you think I can type properly today? So what this is gonna do is it's going to count all my rows, group the way I had them originally. However, it's only gonna give me the ones where the count is greater than three. And now you can see I'm excluding everything one, two, and three, or zero. Well, obviously zero because there's, they wouldn't even be found anyways to be added up. So this allows you to eliminate rows of data out of your aggregates where the count is less than, more than. You could actually do some other math in here if you wanted to. Um, you can actually do some comparisons if you wanted to. Where the count, you could actually literally say where the count is equal to four. And only give me the ones that there's only four. Um, so. Number one, it retrieves all the rows. Number two, it filters the rows. Number three, it does the math. Having operates after all those other steps have happened. I've seen people that get lazy and use the having clause as a way to filter stuff out that really is not the purpose of having. Um, like I've seen people go having city equal to Argyle why can I not type today? And that works. That's not what it's for. So essentially what it's doing is it's going to pull back absolutely everything in the database, do the math, and then filter it to Argyle. Whereas for performance reasons, 
if you had city equal to Argyle in the where clause, everything would run a lot faster because it would only retrieve the rows that apply to Argyle and operate math on that. So instead of operating against, well, this is a really small database, instead of operating against 2,000 rows, it would operate against four. Yes, the computer's still showing like 0000, zero, zero, zero on the runtimes because A, my hard drive is fast. Two, my RAM is fast. Three, the database is minuscule. But if you're talking about a database with millions of rows of data, that is a pointless query because you're just creating extra work. The, the point of having is to filter out after the math has happened. Um, next week, when I start talking about the more expensive queries, the complicated, the more the most complicated queries you're going to learn about this term. Um, you'll see why sometimes having, you'd want something to be having greater than zero, like the count greater than zero. Because sometimes, depending on what kind of query you're running, you might actually have values of zero. Um, if I turn this around and go like this, I go select uh, star from order lines. Okay, now let's just go, uh, Order ID, comma, um, count of star, group by uh, order ID, having count Okay, does anybody want to take a guess at what this what this query is doing? There's nothing I have I didn't do already, but if somebody wanted to cipher this, or give it to me in a single plain English sentence. And I know most people in here are overthinking it. Yes. Yeah, that's the technical phrase. In other words, I want to know all orders that have at least two, th uh, has more than two things in it. That's the plain English version of what you just said. There's nothing wrong with what you said. Technically, totally correct. It's just had a lot more words than you needed. So sometimes you'll have a manager that comes up to you and goes, I want to know what orders have a lot of items in it. Because maybe that is a good customer that we need to sell more drugs to in this case. And some people buy a, some person bought six, four, five, three, four, six. I think the max might be six. Oh, there's a seven. <laughs> yep. Okay. This is where things get a little weird. And I'm going to be talking about that towards the end. Uh, but I might as well address it now since you brought it up. You cannot run an aggregate on an aggregate. So for example, you want to know the max of the count. Yeah. So there is a way to write it without needing an aggregate on an aggregate, and I'll show you that in a second. The reason why you can't do an aggregate, can anybody take a guess why you can't run an aggregate on an aggregate? Here, I'll even try to run it for you. Maybe the error message will give you a hint. Do you know what? I don't think I've ever tried doing this on MySQL. This should be interesting. Yes, that's actually the most useless error message ever. Okay. So other database engines will say you cannot nest aggregate functions. You can't nest aggregate functions because the math has already happened. It only does the math once. Pulls the records, filters the records, groups it, does the math. Oh, I want you want me to do more math? No, you get one round of math. The by the time basically you're trying to tell it to do a max on while it hasn't even finished summarizing the data yet. So it needs to summarize the data, then pass it out to the max. The problem is that. 
the max is part of the summarizing part. So you're, you're trying to tell that to do two things at the same time and it says no. So your question is actually an easy one to answer without any of the special techniques. Next week, I'll find I'll show you guys something more robust. However, I can do this. Um, oh, that's driving me nuts. So if I go uh, order by count of star descending, suddenly we got the max, right? And then we go, but I only want to know the one. And now we've got, that's cool. Order 666 has nine, has the most drugs. Total fluke in the randomization of the data. But that's how you'd get what you're asking. By applying multiple different techniques at the same time, one after another. So we are pulling it back. All the rows, we don't even have a where clause. We're doing a count of star. We're adding up all the rows. We're grouping it by the order ID. So far, so good. Now, it's done doing the math. So now it's going to do an order by, which means, okay, order by is the second last thing that ever happens in an SQL query. It sorts, because now it's done doing all the other work. And then you're saying, it, just give me the first one you find. If I wanted to find out the top five, I could go limit five, and it gives me the top five. Which is kind of cool, because it literally goes nine, eight, seven, six. There's two sevens. So that is how you answer that one question that you had. So having occurs between the group by and the order. Having will filter it out, then it sorts. So if I go back to the slides, um, so Okay, um, I will explain this. In general, I've always put the where before the group by. Um, why? Because I've only ever seen one database server that lets you switch them around. And um, that was a long, long time ago. And it was a really strange database engine. Oracle requires it. Microsoft SQL Server requires it. Postgres requires it. Requires it. MySQL requires it. So therefore, as a rule of thumb, uh, group by always comes in after where. And then, you know, some people think there's ambiguity when you have both the word where and having, both keywords in your query. I think I explained it fairly well what the difference is between them. Um, so the SQL query serve the SQL optimizer and the processor will always do the where clause before it does having. It filters it before it does the math, and then it does the having. Okay, so that covers this, this, and I did that also. And that's the one about trying to do um, needing the group by. I already explained that one. Yes. In theory, yes, but not today. That's involving joins and subqueries and crap, and that's next week's topic. Yes, you can do it, uh, but it is way outside of today's scope. Um, one kettlefish at a time. Um, there's also something called set operations, which you can use. Uh, MySQL really sucks at them. It only supports one set operation. But that's actually another thing I think I'm covering next week is set operations. Um, okay, so another limitation to the aggregates is you can't use an aggregate in the where clause. Can anybody take a guess why you can't use the aggregate in the where clause? I already actually I already explained why you can't. I just didn't say it explicitly. Let's think about the order of operations one more time. We're, yeah. That's exactly it. You can't operate an aggregate until you've already retrieved all the data. The where clause 
filters the data before it gets retrieved. So you go to retrieve the data, it limits it, and then the aggregate happens. If you try to put the aggregate inside the where clause, it's not going to work because the math hasn't happened yet. Therefore, it can't, which is why they invented the having clause. Literally, this is the use case for having. Which would be actually be a really interesting one to run. Hang on. Let's go. Um, sum total. And the average total. Let's run this really quick. Um, actually, you know what? I don't want that. Actually, I still want that one, though. Okay, so right now I've got my average total and my sum total. Now I could go having the AVG. I don't even know if this is actually going to work when I'm about to try. I don't know if that's going to work. No. Damn, I thought it was going to work. Goes so there's always a use case that you've never thought of. Yes. Pardon? Spacing means nothing. Uh, the only thing that that's important is white space between keywords. Uh, I mean, I could have this be you know like that and you know like this, like that, and that would work. Um, there is a way to write what I'm trying to do. I just can't do it with what I'm trying to teach today. But yes, as you can see, the white space means nothing. That's unfortunate that this example doesn't work. That would have been a cool trick to learn. And why is this still tabbed? Okay, so. Went through this. Did that one just show up twice? It did, excellent. So, interesting. Okay, I forgot about this slide. I know I skimmed through them last night, but obviously I wasn't paying attention hard enough. So what this is saying, and I, this has nothing to do with aggregate functions. I just don't know why it's in here. This one here is doing some math. It's kind of cool. Um, so what it's doing is this. If I go select uh, cost times quantity, comma, total, and I'm going to get rid of this, right? Go, go. So you can see that our um, cost times quantity is equal to our total. If I were to go and frig with the data, I could actually test to see if this can be equal or not equal. So that exact query, what it's trying to do is this. And in my case, there's just like the example slide, nothing returns. It's this defined where sometimes there's anomalies in your data. So it's saying, okay, we know that the cost times the quantity should be equal to the total in theory. Uh, but sometimes, you know, something happens and the data gets out of whack. After somebody comes in and modifies a record, but then the software doesn't catch the fact that something changed and it doesn't update, you know, the appropriate spots. Um, so essentially all it's saying is it's going cost times quantity, not equal to the total, which is literally what this is. Um, that's known as an, an expression, as in it's math. And you can basically treat your SQL editor as a calculator if you really wanted to, you know. It'll do math for you. Super fancy calculator. 
uh, totally not what it's for, but it can do it. Um, normally, you'll do it. You'll do expressions to figure out um, things like taxes or discounts or whatever. So if we know something is nineteen ninety nine and we know we're charging thirteen percent tax, you know we know that's the taxes. And if we had it in the database that the taxes was a predefined column somewhere else, we could theoretically just run the math, figure out the taxes for something totally self-contained without needing to actually have magic numbers. Um, did, you guys, did you guys learn about magic numbers yet? One person saying yes. I got a bunch of people saying no. Magic numbers is evil in programming. I've had many chats with junior developers about them shoving magic numbers in the database. Not necessarily in the database, in the application. If I go, if I greater than four, do something, right? Here's our happy Java. Or C or whatever. Can anybody, can anybody spot the magic number? The four. What's four? Where does four come from? Why is it four? Nobody knows. That's a magic number. We try to avoid that in database work too. So we tend to store all our values in the database so we can retrieve them and not have to manually fix things later. Okay. So that's talking about the expressions. And another expression was the concat, which I talked about last week. And we've got another one, which is uh, trim. R trim, we've got trim, R trim, L trim. In other words, trims, trims the white space. R trim trims the white space from the right side of the string. L trim trims from the left side of the string. Normally, you just use trim because you want to strip the white space from both sides. Um, there's a bunch of other functions, you know, substring functions. You want to find a pattern, you know, certain characters just are these letters contained in another one? I'm not sure if they're going to actually have them in here. No, they don't show some of the more useful functions in here. Um, but so, for example, if I were to come back over here and go select uh, substring. Oh, man, I can't remember the syntax for substring. I do the same thing you guys do. Google it. There we go. String position length. Okay. So if I go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and I go position two for two, it'll return that. So that's substring. That's actually a useful one. Um, an example of a useful version of this would be if let's say we got we've got a postal code and we want to start at position one and we want the first three characters we can extract the first three characters of a so that's a substring um if i went for four that would include the space which you can't really see here but there is a space in here so on that, I could always slap a good old trim. And now you still can't see it, but take my word for it. There is, well, actually, if I go, well, because if I put anything in here other than the space, it's not a white space. So, but if I do this, oh, actually I could go. Think it's len? No, nope. length. There we go. Three. If I take the sub string, uh, sub the trim out, now you can see the length is four because the space is included in my my thing. So those are a couple of examples of the the functions that are not included in the slides that are actually useful. Um, the, the the top set of strings are the trim, length, and substring. Uh, those are the bit most useful uh, string functions you'll find. Oh, there's one other one that's really handy. 
Okay. I go, let's just say I've got a string that looks like, like this. Great. Keyboard vomit. I could go, force the whole thing to upper string. And that does the opposite, forces everything to lowercase, which is, you know, also handy. Um, handier in other database engines that are case sensitive. MySQL is case insensitive. In other words, you have to tell it explicitly to be case sensitive. And I, I don't remember off the top of my head how to do it. There's a special little character you're supposed to put in front of your string to tell it to be literal. Um, I'd have to go look it up because you have an idea how often I work with MySQL. Um, but in other database engines where it is case sensitive, you'll often use upper and lower to force things to uppercase and lowercase on your pat matching strings because you need to be case insensitive. Okay, so those are, that was today's uh, slides. I just figured I'd cover a few of the more useful string functions that aren't included in slides that really should be. Um, anything that's not in the slides is not gonna be on the test at the end of the term. So don't panic about the last three things if you didn't catch them. It's all cool. Now, to part two of today, which is gonna make everybody's day. Uh, by everybody's day, it's not gonna make anybody's day. Bruh. Okay. <sighs> all right. Assignment two. Once again, groups, sorry. I enjoy that as much as you guys do. Um, again, groups of two or three. Be selective with your partners. Some of you have already learned your lessons once. You have learned as of the last today, the last three lectures counting today, Everything you need to do this la this assignment except for the last little bit. So that means you have everything you need to start working on it now. Okay? You will submit four files. And based on those, the directions, each of the files will contain something different. And each section is graded individually. Um, there is a DDL command file where it's lab six. You create the tables, create the relationships. Yes, you will be tested based for on this that you followed the diagram explicitly. You don't get to get be creative. You are gonna follow that diagram like your life depends on it, or I should say your grade depends on it, because it does. Um, as in there's 10, so this grade, the 17 points for the DDL, 10 points of it is if you followed the diagram. So, you know, that's a good chunk of that first piece. You're gonna generate some test data. And if you want, I can show you guys how to generate test data next week, or I can do it in lab, whatever. Um, basically, you guys have all created test data already because I had you guys do it as part of lab six. You just manually did it. There are ways to actually automatically generate the data. Obviously, that database I've been using for the examples is all data I generated, and I generated it using uh, the tool that I've got linked in this assignment description. Uh, I guess I should make that a little bit bigger. And Brightspace does a wonderful job not letting me make it bigger. Um, again, 17 points for the second piece. Uh, actually, it's 15 points. No, 17. Two points for the comment block. Yes, I'm giving you points for comments. Two. You know, it is what it is. 10 points for the actual insert statements and five points for data coverage. In other words, did you cover the entire database with your inserts? Uh, then you're gonna have a series of queries and the format of these queries is somewhat similar, except the fact that you're generating your own data. I can't say, I want you to give me everybody in Ontario because you might not generate any data for someone in Ontario. 
However, I'm giving you a description of what kind of query I want you to give me. And you're going to give me 11 queries. And as of uh, today, um, you should be able to do number one, number two, number three, number four, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so you should be able to do most of these. Uh, the ones you'll need are, uh, for next week's lecture, is 5, 6, um, 10, and 11. So four out of the 11 you need next week's lecture. So, you know, you've got a fair amount you can start on. Um, if next week's lecture goes as quick as this week's lecture, I'm actually going to dive into the following week's lecture so that you have everything you need to finish the assignment as of next week. And it's literally creating um, two views. And it's, you know, creating views is stupid easy. Um, I can't believe I'm giving six, uh, I'm giving four points for that. Really, it should only be like two. But you're getting two points for the comment. <laughs> so, just saying. Okay, so what database diagram are you guys going to use? If you, when you go into the assignment um, itself, uh, you will see that there's a diagram. And I just finished cleaning it up. You'll notice the date is today. That's on the version of the diagram. Uh, because I did have some feedback from last term about some students that complained about some stupid pointless columns. I'm like, you know what? I can't even argue with you about it. So I cleaned up the database. It's actually smaller than the ones last term. So it's a little simpler. Uh, the only reason is because I wanted to make my life easier and not have to field stupid questions. The same question over and over and over again. Um, you will see this diagram is very similar to what you saw in lab six. There's just more tables. There's somewhat more relationships. And, you know, you've got a variety of items in here that you need to do. You will, if when you create the tables, you will be checked to see whether or not they match that data structure. Okay. I did put in... Brightspace, right at the end of the assignments area, you'll see that there's a separate page with the instructions. Because until you join a group, you can't actually see the assignment. As some of you discovered last, you know, on the last assignment where people are emailing me the Saturday morning before the assignment is due saying, I can't see the assignment. I go, hmm, aren't you starting a little late? Bruh. Uh, I don't know where to submit. Well, I can't see where you submit. Well, because you're supposed to be part of a group. Did you not contact me? Did you not create a group? So, once again, I'll be creating groups for you guys. I won't be assigning you to the groups. Just like last term, email me with your group members. I would prefer if you do it earlier than later. Um, <laughs> the hardest part of that assignment that most people find is actually creating the constraints and inserting the data in the right order. In other words, creating the foreign keys and then inserting the data to make sure they actually happen. Um, and I've shown this command to many people. Actually, I'm going to do it in here. If I were to go, and I will supply anybody who doesn't remember how to do this, but the recording is here and it's going to be literally the last thing in the recording. So it's going to be pretty easy to find. Why are you not cooperating? I will explain in a second. So the First three lines of your uh, DDL file should resemble something like this. What is this doing? Is it's literally destroying the database every time you run it. So what happens often is the first line destroys it, the second line creates, recreates it, and then it reconnects you to it. And then I can go uh, create table Bob ID int. Auto increment, primary key, name. Okay, so I've got a definition for Bob. 
And I am going to create the database and use it. Right? I'm not going to do the drop. Great. So I've got my database. And if I refresh over here, you can see I'm connected to assignment two. And I'm going to create the table called Bob. And if I refresh this, you'll see now that I've got a table called Bob. Now, let's just say you decide, oh, now I need to... Um, Create another table. Called Frank. Like this. And I'm going to hit run. And you're going to get an error. Why? Because Bob already exists. That means you can't test your entire script from top to bottom. So when you use this block, which I, you know, a bunch of students. I showed them how to do this as part of lab six, the ones that asked. If I run a whole script, I can run it over and over and over again to my heart's content. And every single time, the database is clean. Why is this important? Because you'll have people that sit there, and I've had students over the years do this, that's why I decided to teach this particular technique. With What they'll do is they'll create table number one, run it, copy paste it, erase their editor, create table two, Oh, that one works. Copy paste it into an editor. Create table three. Copy paste. Clear. And they keep manually building it all piece by piece. Which is cool. And then they realize, oh, for table three, I messed up. I needed to actually you know, name the column this. Or I needed to call my foreign key this. So then they create an alter table command. And they put it in. Then they give me this big fat file that hasn't actually been tested from top to bottom. And then... I run it, and there's an error. And you know what happens when there's an error, right? Minus one for every error I have to fix until it works. Um, I've had people get like zero for that first part of the assignment. Because I will neg negative it past the just the 10. For every, basically, but if I have to waste my time fixing your code, you're going to pay for it. That's how it is in the real world. And that's how it's going to be for this. So that first bit allows you to purge your database and start fresh so you can ch check your entire script. Which leads me to, when is it due? It is due. Uh, hang on, i got to make sure that the due date's right on this. Yes, December 4th. End of day. So you've got... Um, almost three weeks to do it. Why is it due December 4th and not like December 9th, some of you may ask? Because guess what you get to do with me the week of December 5th? You get to sit with me and you're going to run your code in front of me. And by the time you guys come and sit with me to do the demos, I will already have tried your scripts. Which means that if it doesn't work for me, but it works for you, you fixed it after you submitted. And you still get graded on what you submitted. However, this is me making sure that it is your work, because at least one of you should know how to run all the files. It is going to be the fastest demo you've ever experienced. You sit down, and you're going to run file number one, file number two, file number three, file number four. I see no errors. Congratulations. The demo is done. I've seen it happen in under 15 seconds. It takes longer for people with their laptop down than it does to run the demo. But you have to be able to run it, which is important. And which leads me to the very last topic of interest. Uh, for those of you that may have not have noticed, and some of you have noticed, December 10th, 9 a.m., Saturday. Final exam. Bruh. I have to get up early also on Saturday. Shit, man, I'm always up before 9 on Saturdays, but I've got to get up extra early. So 9 a.m. Saturday morning, you get to have your exam. Congratulations. The database exam is the very first one you're over with. It is your very first exam. Yes. Uh, still being negotiated. You can expect between 45 to 50 multiple guest questions, Scantron. So it's not 
it's only from the second half of the term, last I've heard. Do you notice I'm putting a disclaimer of last I heard on that? That's how it's course is designed, but you know, things have been known to change. Yeah, it's only supposed to be only everything after the break, so only SQL. No. It is not open book. It is in one of two locations, and essentially the way it works is you when you look at Axis, right now it shows two different room numbers. Before the exam, I will tell you guys which room you're supposed to go to. There's 550 of you guys writing. You don't all fit in one place. That means that we are gonna divide the rooms, the groups between the available space. Some of you are gonna be in the gym and some of you are gonna be in some other room, which I don't know what the frig room that is. Um, hang on, let me double check where it was. And D101 and A120. So if you don't know what A120 is, that's the gym. Right next to right next door to Tim Hortons. Uh D101, I have no freaking idea where that is. So if it was H, it'd be the cafeteria. So I'm not sure where D101 is. Which one's building D? H is hospitality and the cafeteria. Maybe D is the cafeteria now. I think they might have renamed it. Anyways. Hey? You know that weird one that's bored of that? Yeah. That might be D101. I'll, I'll double check with the people that are doing this. Essentially, the week before the exam, we'll have finally negotiated who's supposed to go where. And you will go to that room. Just don't don't tire out your arm. I'll get to you in a second. <laughs> nice. I was trying to be nice to her. Now you're laughing at her. Who's the one that looks like a jackass? Um. So because why is this important? Is because we're gonna have boxes at the front where you're gonna drop off your test and your scantron, and after it's done, there's six lecture profs that are going to go and go, and I'm going to go through my test and go, how many people am I missing? And then I got to literally say, I'm missing these five people. And then I got to wait for the other profs to get around to checking their piles. That really, really sucks. Therefore, please come to the right room and please put your test in the right box. Uh, why does that suck? Because that means I can't drop off my grades for, for processing. I want to be done. No later than Monday. <laughs> I've got some God of War to play. I haven't gotten to play it yet. So as soon as I'm done with you guys, I'm sitting in my basement and playing video games. I'm going to be completely honest <laughs> about it. With me, yes. After December 10th and you've given me your tests and they're in the right box and I get them scanned. You will have your grades almost immediately, and we're done. Brightspace, no, dude, it's going to be sitting in the gym with everyone else. Yeah, 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 it's going to be in announcements. I know nobody here actually reads my announcements, but, you know, there's, yeah, there's a few. I'm just making fun of the handful of people that don't. Andriana, I remembered your end. I don't know. Uh, I have to find out what the other profs will. Because if I give it to you guys and none of the other profs do it, then there's going to be all kinds of complaints. So i got to find out. Trust me, th this exam is way clearer even than the, mid the midterm was. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know. But that means i got to come up with another 45 unique questions, 50 questions that aren't as close enough to the real ones. Just saying, that's not quite how that works. Uh, but yes, that's a valid question. I'll check the other ones, see if anybody else is willing to provide questions to do a quick round of testing. What's wrong with you, dude? 
Uh, okay, so that being said, that's the end of today. You know what's happening about the exam, roughly. You know what's happening about the assignment. I covered aggregates for today. Next week, I'm covering joins and subqueries. It's the worst topic of the term. <laughs>